everyone for coming. My name is Brock. And I'm here to tell you about my thesis, which is really about how we gather the information to be used to confront and curtail poaching in marine protected areas. What I want to tell you guys about is some terminology before we begin. And so, poaching is defined in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as trespassing for the purpose of stealing game or to take game or fish illegally. So, when I use poaching today, I'm really defining it as fishing inside a no fishing zone, regardless of actual success in catching fish. The intention's there. And this is interchangeable with non-compliance or non-compliance with spatial zoning. And so, on the other hand, Compliance is when people follow or abide by the rules and the regulations. So there's numerous ecological consequences of poaching, and one of the largest is obviously the outcomes that diminish when poaching occurs. And here on the Great Barrier Reef, there's a lower biomass of large predators in no-take zones compared to no-entry zones, and that's often been attributed to poaching in these no-take zones. And Russ and Alpha back in 1998 described a 67% reduction of predatory fish biomass in Subayan Reserve when protection broke down. And this happened in the case of two to three months. So it happened very quickly, which again serves to emphasize that even short bursts of poaching can easily and rapidly negate the effects of decades of protection. And now there's also social consequences of poaching. And the first being that free riding, or these poachers that are going in and stealing from everyone else, can undermine broader support. If this happens at a, a large enough rate, I suppose you could say, poaching might actually become socially acceptable, which would then hinder your management efforts. And this may result in reduced ecological outcomes that then damage resource-dependent livelihoods, like tourism operators, commercial or subsistence fishers. So, Poaching in protected areas. I'll tell you right now that poaching renders many of the world's protected areas, both terrestrial and marine, ineffective. And a lot of times the efforts to reduce poaching fail because they lack the necessary information to be used for targeted behavioral and management interventions. And so that brings me to the overall problem that this thesis addresses, which is gathering information on poaching is incredibly difficult. It's illegal, it's cryptic or clandestine in nature, and it's often socially undesirable. So, how do we measure poaching? Now back in 2015, I did a quick lit review, which wasn't so quick, but what we found <laughs> was that there is quite a few different ways to measure poaching or to monitor it. And these include changes in fish behavior or the size structure or changes in your biomass relative to your expected value. You also have law enforcement records when people are actually caught doing it. You have remote monitoring or satellite data that you can use. You have direct observation, which can happen from the air, from the shore, from the vessels. And then you have indirect observation. And the reason I've highlighted that this here is because I want to make an example of it, and I'll talk about this further, but direct fishing gears are really good for indicating when there's relative fishing effort in a no-take zone compared to a fish zone, right? But it can't tell you who's doing it. It can't tell you why it's happening. So you need these other different methods that can kind of fill in the gaps. So in this case, there's not a single method that's going to tell you everything about poaching. And that's something that I'm going to come back to time and time again in this thesis, is that you need to triangulate methods. You need to you know, combine to get a holistic picture. So sorry. Now we have expert in opinion where you elicit people's advice or people's take on what the compliance levels are. And then finally you have direct questioning. So your social surveys that can fill in some of those other questions or answers that you don't get in other realms. So let's quickly look at the breakdown of the usage of these methods. And when we went and looked in 2015, we found that the vast majority of information from these methods is qualitative in nature, not quantitative. And as scientists, I think we can all agree that the quantitative measures are more important, are not necessarily more important, sorry qualitative folks, um, <laughs> but I can be slightly more informative in certain ways when you're trying to figure out what you're non-compliance level is, right? And the point I want to drive home again is that every method is likely to have biases. It's likely to give you incomplete information on that activity, and then, therefore, you need to triangulate your methods, right? So the first research gap I identified is this lack of multiple method approaches, which gives us little to no understanding of whether systematic biases exist among these different measurement methods. And I address, address this in my thesis with my first research question of how can the prevalence of poaching be measured 
get an expected nature. So the second thing I want to talk to you today is about the drivers of poaching or how you understand poaching. And there's numerous disciplines that can be used and have been used to explore this topic. So the three traditional approaches that I focus on most are that of the rational choice approach, the normative approach, and the institutional approach. And as you can see, they all overlap. But the big difference is that a lot of these disciplines or these approaches have their own scale at which they investigate the issue. Either they do it at a micro level or a macro level. Secondly, they'll look at different types of methodologies to investigate it. And then they'll use their own language as well. And then on top of that, you have all these other disciplines that have kind of looked at the issues, but using their own lens, right? So again, it doesn't yield this holistic picture that we want. So you want to end up in the middle there, right? And so now today, I'd like to share with you my journey as compliance cop rock <laughs> and how I ended up right there in the middle. And you may note that that is the same way that cyclones rotate and toilets flush down here. <laughs> but I haven't been able to empirically validate that yet, so stay tuned for my postdoc. <laughs> so in the rational choice, it's based on the premise that rational actor is someone who weighs the costs and benefits of doing a behavior and they act in their own interest. And this is grounded in microeconomic models of behavior. And it was introduced in 1968 by Becker's Crime and Punishment, and it really forms the foundation of deterrence theory and criminology. And so there's two main ways to influence behavior. And as Gary just told me, you know, it's the sticks or the carrots. You can hit someone with a stick or offer them a carrot to get what they want or to get what you want. But the problem is, is that although it provides a strong background when poaching is financially motivated, it doesn't necessarily consider your social or your moral obligations, right? And this can lead to the perverse outcome where sanctions actually increase crime. And this is defiance theory in criminology, where people end up poaching just in an act of protest or in rebellion because they don't think that that rule is legitimate. And so what I want to leave you with is a quote by Daniel Kahneman, a very prominent cognitive psychologist, that people's beliefs, wishes, and hopes are not always anchored in reason. People are normative animals. We're shaped and affected by the way things happen around us. So in the second approach, you have your norms, and these are your perceived standards of behavior, and these can be social norms, personal norms, differences in opinions on those norms. And so in social psychology, you have the theory of planned behavior. And this has been used time and time again to look at a vast majority of behaviors, including environmental behavior. And the way it basically works is that you have the behavior here, which is very specific, it's poaching. That's the one behavior that you're interested in looking at. And that's moderated by your intention to poach, which in itself is shaped by three predeterminants. The subjective norm, or how society views that poaching behavior, your attitudes, or your personal view about poaching. And in this case, I would argue that your personal view about the management of poaching as well is very important. And then your perceived control, or the ease of poaching, or the difficulty of poaching. But the main point here, again, is that the focus is on your individual, your micro scale, and it just does not generally address your macro scale issues that we know are important, right? So the third approach that I want to talk to you about is the institutional approach. And everyone here is hopefully familiar with Hardin's tragedy of the commons, right? Where he goes out and he talks about the fact that people act in their own self-interest, they ex over-exploit a commonly managed resource, and it eventually collapses. But the institutional literature has really explored on why this doesn't happen and how people can effectively come together to co-manage their own resources. And in this case, an institution is either a formal rule, like a law, or an informal rule, kind of like a norm, right? And these govern our interactions. And so you have the behavior here, and then you have things like user characteristics, you know, maybe a fisher's avidity or whether or not they've previously engaged with the authorities or the management on an issue, or whether or not fishing is important. And then you also have some larger scale stuff from the governance system that describes the governance system itself, whether there's operational rules, whether there's collective choice rules, and maybe something like the absence or presence of graduated sanctions, where the punishment that is put out for and then a violation is going to actually increase either the severity of the violation or the occurrence of the violation, right? 
And so the point I want to bring across here about the institutional approach is they often assume that your actors are rational. They don't take in kind of that micro level influences that theory of planned behavior, for instance, does. And so this leads to this difference in scale, right? And so to study poaching, we've integrated an institutional framework with this theory of individual behavior. And I got a note here that I also added in personal norms. And as you'll see later, I added in a heck of a lot more, but I didn't want to put it all there. Uh, but this is how we go through and we start exploring poaching behaviors. And this leads to the second research gap that I identified, and that's that few studies that have actually explored the drivers of poaching in marine protected areas. And on top of that, studies that often do look at poaching, both in terrestrial and in marine protected areas, suffer from what they call disciplinary silo thinking. So you have all these separate disciplines with their own language, their own methods, and they're not sharing information across. So that, again, that just really keeps us from getting a good grasp on what all the different predeterminants of people's poaching behaviors are. So I address that in my second research question, which I look at in chapters two and three, which is what influences it drives people's poaching decisions. Now the third thing I want to talk to you about today is this issue of paper parks. Everyone's probably heard of them. Basically, you have a park on paper. It formally exists, but you don't have any management capacity, you don't have enforcement capacity, and in the end you get really low levels of Clients, so you might as well not have one, right? And one solution that's gaining a, bit of, gaining a bit of steam these days is to engage the latent surveillance and enforcement capacity of resource users. And this way I mean the informal latent surveillance capacity, right? So not formalized monitoring, but informal. But I'll tell you right now that engaging resource users can have some serious consequences. And then 2015, no, 2016, sorry, you had over 250 people that were killed by either trying to defend their land or their environment. So there's a lot of ethics that are involved here. And what I want to tell you about today is how institutions may be useful for responsibly engaging these resource users. So now this leads to my third research gap, which is the fact that there are increasing numbers of attempts to bolster compliance through engaging these resource users. But there's a relative paucity of research on how fishers will respond to observed poaching and what role the institutions may play. So the third research question that I use to address this is what influences people's voluntary or informal surveillance. So I've just told you about three critical research gaps, and I've just told you about my three research questions that I'm using to answer those gaps. So I'm going to focus in on the first one now, which is about how can we actually measure the prevalence of poaching. So to do this, we went out in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and we developed a social ecological approach to assess poaching. And in this way, we used quantitative measurements and quantitative estimates of compliance levels. And we did this through UVCs, or Underwater Visual Census of Discarded Fishing Gears, and then we used some specialized questioning techniques in our social surveys. We also developed some proxy indicators of poaching in our social surveys. So the way we did this is we looked at 30 sites overall in the Palm and the Whit Sunday Island group for our discarded fishing gears. And we had these paired both in no-take and fish zones. So uh, we had an even number of 15 and 15. And with our boat, sur boat ramp surveys, we did these in Townsville over 21 months. We collected 682 total surveys. And I'll get a little bit further into our findings. So first when you look at your discarded fishing gears, we went in in 2012, we surveyed, and then we removed line from these sites. Each site was roughly 8,000 meters squared. And we came back in 2014, we resurveyed the same sites, and what we found was there is absolutely no difference in the accumulated line between fish to no-take zones. So now I did have a p-value up there of 0.29, just to reflect again what you can see. And so what this tells us is that Considerable amounts of poaching are occurring in areas that were previously thought to be among the best enforced on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, what about the spatial distribution of poaching efforts? What can we learn from discarded fishing gears? So we went out and we identified what we call poaching hotspots. So these hotspots were areas that had reaccumulated line densities that were higher than the mean for all protected areas or no fishing zones which is indicated here in this dotted line. And then you have the mean here for fish zones. You can see that the lines aren't very far apart. And now we have five spots that look like poaching hotspots. 
And these are on Iris Point on Orpheus Island, here on Curacao Island, in the Palm Island groups. And then you have Blue Pearl Bay and Langford Island. And what you'll see when you look at it is that these hotspots are often near the edges of no-take boundaries. And they're often away from passive surveillance. So this is obviously going to have ramifications on how they're sending their patrol vessels out and where they're looking. And secondly, it indicates to us that there may be some night poaching that's going on as well, which uh, the Marine Park Authority has indicated is occurring. So in all, it shows you that there's widespread poaching efforts in both regions, and the one thing I absolutely need to acknowledge is that there is the potential for inflated accumulation rates in the palms. Traditional owners are legally allowed to fish under the Native Title Act of 1993 in these areas. So there's definitely some, you know, some uh, potential for inflation here, and that's one of the drawbacks of this indirect observation, but either way, these no-take zones are receiving a heck of a lot of fishing pressure compared to what we would expect. So now I'll tell you a bit about specialized questioning techniques that we use to estimate poaching levels. First, we use self-administration via an iPad. We handed an iPad to somebody and we said, will you please answer the question on the screen, knowing that we'll never know what your answer is. Then we went out and we used the unmatched count technique. And so the way this works is respondents get one of two lists. They either get a treatment list that has four activities, or sorry, the control list that has four activities, or the treatment list that has the same four legal fishing activities with the addition of fishing inside a no-take zone. And so we ask people to tell us how many, but not which activities they do. And when you go back, you can actually look at the means and compare the means to figure out what your level of poaching is in that community that you surveyed. So for instance, if you get 3.5% or 3.5 activities for the treatment and 3.2 for your control, subtract that, you get 0.3, which indicates 30% poaching prevalence in that community. So then the other one that we used was the random response technique. And this one's a bit more involved, so bear with me. But what this does is it uses this randomizing device that I'm holding in my hand <laughs> to intentionally or to intentionally obscure someone's answer, the truthfulness of their answer from me, the interviewer. So in this case, I'd walk up and I'd say, Josh, I want you to take a look at this. There's a viewing window right here and there's a bunch of different colored beads in here. So just tip one of these beads into the window, figure out what color it is, and then follow this decision tree without telling me what color the bead is. And in this case, it'll either direct him to answer truthfully, a forced yes or an automatic yes, or an automatic no, and what you can see here is that we know the probability that people will get each different color beat because we designed it that way. So then we can go back, use statistical algebra, and figure out what the overall level of truthfully admitted poaching was in our sample. So the fourth measure, the pro one of the proxy indicators that we've developed and been looking at is the perceived level of poaching. And so previous research has looked at this as well. And it triangulates quite well with the estimates that you get from something like the random response technique, simply asking people, what do you think the level of poaching is in the population? And the other really interesting thing here <coughs> is that there's something called the false consensus effect. And so the false consensus effect is where somebody who engages in illegal behavior actually overestimates the prevalence of that behavior in society. So there's the potential that overestimations of poaching could be used to directly indicate a poacher themselves, right? So, following along with that, we also looked at personally knowing a poacher, because there's a few different social theories, including social learning and subculture theory, that tell us that we're really influenced by those that are close to us. So there's the potential that people who know a poacher are more at risk of poaching themselves, right? <coughs> And so we went out and we estimated the prevalence of poaching with these five different methods. And the first thing you'll see is that poaching levels were estimated to be anywhere between 3 and 13% of the recreational fisher population throughout the entire 21 month study duration. Secondly, this triangulates fairly closely or compares fairly closely to a 2009 non compliance estimate of 10%, where Adrian Arias and Steve Sutton used the random response technique and the perceived level of poaching again. Third thing I want you to take away from here is that our more direct methods, which are specialized and are used regularly in the literature, are still giving us the smallest estimates of non-compliance. So this suggests that there's the potential that these estimates are still subject to some sort of underreporting, right? 
So now I want to focus on these two a little bit more, and that's personally knowing a poacher, received level of poaching, sorry I didn't put the labels here, random response, unmatched count, self-administered questioning. And the way to figure out if the, self, or if the false consensus effect is happening is to go to those 22 poachers of 3% that admitted to poaching with that self-administered questioning, because then you can look directly at their entire data set to see what their perceptions of compliance were, whereas the other ones you kind of have to use proxies to, to indicate it, right? And so when we looked, we saw that poachers did have a slightly higher estimate of non-compliance compared to non-poachers, but this obviously wasn't significant because there is quite a large range here. But then when you look at the hedges G value, which is a measure of effect size that accounts for these differences in sample size as well, you see that it's approaching a relatively medium effect size, which tells us that there's probably a little bit of play here and that this may be operative. And then secondly, you go and you look at people who knew poachers, so we found 13% or about 86 that personally knew poachers and they had significantly higher, substantially and significantly higher estimates of non-compliance compared to those who didn't. So now this indicates to us that these proxies may be useful for indirectly examining poaching. So in summary, substantial amounts of poaching are occurring in some of the areas once considered to be among the best enforced on the Great Barrier Reef. Poaching hotspots do exist and they're typically near the edges of no-take boundaries. Poaching levels may be between 3 and 13%, but there's probably some underreporting happening. And then these two proxy measures, or personally knowing a poacher and perceived levels of poaching may be valid proxy indicators. So now I want to move on to the second theme of this thesis, which is how we understand people's poaching decisions. And in chapter two, we went out and we asked, you know, what can Fisher's perceptions of poaching tell us about the culture of compliance? And to do this, we use the same 682 boat ramp surveys that we collected previously. And overall, we investigated 29 theoretically based predictors of poaching. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll go through a few of the examples so you can get your head around it. But what we did for most of them was look at seven point Likert scale. So we had people rate either their agreement or disagreement. So a one would be a strongly disagree, a four would be a neutral, and a seven would be a strongly agree. So first, you look at the theory of planned behavior, your attitudes, your perceived behavioral control, your underlying outcome beliefs re reflect uh, an individual's cognitive structure, and then the subjective norm or the perceived social pressure. Then I've also added in both the descriptive norm or the perceived behavior of others and the personal norm. And then down here with the institutional aspects, you have consumptive orientation or whether or not somebody's motivated to fish by catch related aspects or fisher avidity, or how, how often they get out fishing, the importance of fishing, whether they fish with others and whether they've been previously engaged. And then from wildlife biology, we also have these motivations to poach, which are typically gathered from surveying people that have been caught poaching before. Uh, we were unable to do that here in this study. Uh, it wasn't because we didn't try, but legally, they care more about the poachers than they do about research. So. Um, <laughs> I want to focus on the subjective and the descriptive norm for a second. And so you're thinking, okay, well, why are these that important? It's because theory tells us that, in this case, Poacher Brock is more influenced by his friends' and family's perceptions than the fishers that he knows. So as our social distance increases away from the people that I know, <laughs> we're supposedly less influenced by their perceptions, right? So that gives us three different levels to look at for the strengths of those different norms. And so these are a bunch of tables, but I'm going to make it easy for you to, you know, kind of disseminate my findings with big circles like this. So nearly all fishes do say that poaching is not personally acceptable, 97%. Again, is that a social desirability bias there? Do they not want to admit that it's acceptable? Who knows? That's one of the challenges. And second, the perceived social acceptability of poaching does increase with social distance. So the further away we get, the less confident we are that people don't approve of poaching, right? And when this really comes out is when you look at the descriptive norm. If people were much more confident that the fishers they know haven't fished in a green zone compared to the fishers that they don't know or the general fishing public, right? And the reason this is important is because of this thing called pluralistic ignorance. And this is basically a phenomenon in social society or in society where People overestimate, so a poacher in this case overestimates 
sorry, a non-poacher, so a compliant individual, right? I gotta make sure I know this. Non-compliant, for a compliant individual. <laughs> is everyone confused? All right, so am I. So somebody who does not poach, perceives that others poach more often, right? And if this misperception isn't corrected, what could happen is this compliant individual like myself could actually change my behavior and adjust it to fit that misperceived norm, right? So they've shown this in binge drinking in college. Everyone assumes that other people binge drink more, so then they themselves end up binge drinking more to fit that norm, right? So we don't want that to happen here. And then secondly, I want to talk about the perceptions of management. So there's relatively, or not relatively, incredibly high perceptions of legitimacy. So this is a really good outcome for the Marine Park Authority. But at the same time, you have roughly 10% of fishers who have some level of distrust, a lack of identification, or perceptions of injustice with the way that the fishing zone or the fishing zones have worked. And then you have a moderate level of fishers who don't think that they have a fair equal share of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And so you're saying, well, these are relatively small numbers. Like, why do we care? If the vast majority are compliant, you know, it's okay, it'll all come out in the end. But these perceptions of management and the interactions that people have with the authorities are incredibly important, and they're demonstrably important for compliance behaviors. So when we look at the outcome beliefs, you see that most fishers accept the rationale for no-take zones. They believe that it makes bigger fish and more fish, right? But at the same time, you still have this moderate level of disbelievers both about whether or not marine reserves work and whether or not poaching would have an environmental consequence, like removing fish from the breeding stock or other environmental consequences. And then you also see that the majority of fishers think that poaching would result in a fine, right? And I wanna make the distinction that this is not measuring the perceived risk of being detected or getting caught. It's simply saying, well, if I was to poach, yeah, it might, might end up in a fine, but what are the chances I'm gonna get caught? It's a big marine park. Only so many law enforcement guys out there, right? So stay tuned to that idea, I'll come back to it. And again, we found really high levels of awareness. Many people knew how to get access to information and they knew where the no-take boundaries were, where they fished, but most of the law enforcement guys can probably tell you the first thing anyone tells you if they get pulled up in a green zone, oh, I didn't know any better, right? So data suggests this isn't the case. Uh, and then there's moderate levels of fishers who would not be deterred by fines, gear confiscation, or social shame, right? So. Ideally, we hope these fishers are driven by their personal or moral norms, but alternatively, they may not perceive that high risk of detection while poaching. So now I want to talk to you about how we measure the perceived motivations to poach in this case. And I've told you again and again that we need to understand why people do this, but asking them directly about why they poach is unlikely to give us honest answers. So we need to indirectly investigate these reasons for people to poach. And this has been done previously in other research to examine doping behaviors in uh, athletes where they've indirectly looked at somebody's behavior. And what this allows people to do is to use this massive impersonality to project their own beliefs and behaviors onto that measure of, uh, or onto that behavior itself so you can still measure it, right? And so we went out and we looked at nine different perceived motivations for others to poach. And these are all based on theory and our qualitative questioning that guided our design. And the first thing we found was that most fishers think that poaching is opportunity-based, right? So they think it's happening because there's better fishing or a lower risk of detection, rather than acts of defiance or protest. And again, if you look at the difference between spear fishers and line fishers, there really isn't much, except that spear fishers thought there was less defiance and acts of rebellion. But what this suggests to us is what we call an information deficit communication model, or telling people simply, these green zones are working, don't poach in them, it's not gonna happen, right? It's actually gonna encourage them to go out and poach. So when you have these two together, people know it's better fishing and a low risk of detection, they're gonna go, like they're gonna go and poach it. So in summary, we had really high levels of perceived legitimacy, some level of distrust or injustice in management, Pluralistic ignorance and the false consensus effect may be contributing to the continuation of poaching. And poaching may be opportunity-based because they know there's more fish and a low risk of detection. So that brings me to my third chapter, and this is where we investigated these behavioral drivers and potential proxy indicators. We wanted to know whether or not these drivers actually align or triangulate across these different response variables. 
which were the admitted poaching via the random response, perceived levels of poaching, and personally knowing a poacher. And then what we did is we took these 29 predictor variables that we had, and we used latent variable production to shrink them down <coughs> to 13 drivers. And I'm not going to get into details on how we did that, but if you're curious, come talk to me, I'll let you know. And we used three different models that we developed to look at these behaviors, right? And so, first and foremost, we developed the Bayesian rare events approach with the logistic Bernoulli model for the random response technique. We used the linear mixed effects model to per or, uh, perceive levels of plot po poaching, excuse me. And we used rare events logistic regression for personally knowing the poacher itself. And we, as we assessed our model fit by comparing null models with full models, right? The two things I want you to remember is, first of all, we use forgiving wording on our norm statements. So in this case, a higher score is the perception that others poach and that poaching is socially acceptable, rather than asking it the other way around, which is going to bias the sample. And the second is that we did the same thing for behavioral control. So again, higher scores mean that people have think fines, gear confiscation, or shame would prevent them from poaching. So the first thing you look at is this right here. So this is our Bayesian model, random response technique. And you'll look at a couple of things. First being that everything is gray. Everything's crossing. We found no significance, right? You'll also notice that the effect sizes here are massive. So what we believe has happened is the fact that you have 7% of individuals who have admitted to poaching via the random response technique. But you have 15% of statistical noise that's been introduced into that sample. And that's obscuring something that's got a relatively high effect size, right? Like that's probably a 12 or something like that. And that's probably a three or a four. But either way, we've got so much variance that we just can't predict or we can't pick out that significance. And so that's one of the drawbacks of the random response technique. It's not that good when the uh, admitted level of poaching is really low. And then when you look at these other two models, you see that it triangulated 66% of the time. And in both cases, it pulled out the descriptive social norm and Fisher avidity, right? So the descriptive social norm, or the idea that other people poach, is theoretically grounded. It's been proven to be a predictor of poacher in a lot of different studies now. So that makes sense. So people that thought it was more, people that thought others poached more often were more likely to poach themselves. And then you look at Fisher avidity, and this can be kind of looked at in two different ways. One is the fact that people that fish more often are more likely to be on the water to see poaching and to personally know a poacher. But on the other hand, people that look at fisher specialization, which is very similar to avidity. So those who fish more often are more specialized. And those specialized fishers are more likely to support a daily catch limit or a bag limit or a size limit than they are a protected area. Mm -hmm. So. Then we have two other results for the perceived level of poaching that seem to suggest that this is a good proxy measurement for indicating an individual. And that is whether or not they thought it was personally acceptable and whether or not they thought other people believed it was personally acceptable. So the one thing that I forgot to mention is anything to the right of the dotted line is poaching. Anything to the left is compliance. I always forget that. I ran through it four times. <laughs> Still remembered it by the end, so it's okay, right? <laughs> And then we had a couple of counterintuitive results, and this is the environmental belief. So people that thought poaching was going to have a consequence, a negative consequence for the environment, were potentially more inclined to poach, right? So this is telling us that this may or may not support uh, the theory, but there's really been very little theoretical research that's done on this. But in the end, this with the fact that Reserve beliefs or people who thought reserves didn't work were potentially more compliant, just doesn't add up, right? So, in the end, the random response technique does not perform well when their admitted poaching levels are lower than that intentionally introduced noise. But we did find a 66% overlap of significant predictors for our proxy variables. And there's limited evidence that these can be used as proxy indicators of an individual poacher. But there is evidence that suggests you can use them at the community level, right? So more research is needed here. And so finally, on to my last chapter, which is what influences people's voluntary surveillance and enforcement decisions? And to do this, we expanded the scope of our study. And we went out and we surveyed over 2,000 fishers living adjacent to 55 MPAs in seven different countries. And we asked about four main things, whether or not they previously observed poaching, what the actions after observing poaching were, what their reasons for inaction were. And then we also looked at the effects of institutions 
on these actions. And so we looked at four different institutional conditions that aligned across all of these different study sites. And that was participation in decision making, graduated sanctions, rule agreement, and then the size of the MPA. And so overall, we found that nearly half of all fishers had previously observed poaching. But the most common response was in action, which was especially high in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and in Costa Rica. Confronting and reporting were especially common in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, where customary marine tenure exists, right? Where people can manage their own resources and can legally do that. And then also, joining poachers is relatively rare, except for in the Western Indian Ocean, which was Ken Kenya and Tanzania, right? So then we looked at reasons for inaction. And we found three primary reasons, and those being conflict avoidance, the fact that, or the, the perception that it wasn't their jurisdiction or their concern, and then the perception that poaching was a survival strategy, right? And so this highlights a drawback of territorial user rights for fishing, right? Like people that can't, people that are responsible for enforcing only their patch are not gonna make enforcement decisions or enforcement behaviors on someone else's patch. And that's something that often doesn't even get considered when we talk about how great turfs are. And then second, or thirdly, you can see that in Costa Rica, the engagement was really hampered by ineffective governance and conflict. And this is really complicated by the fact that you have such a large narco trafficking institution there that people often are rocking around with assault rifles in their boats, right? So why are you gonna go up and confront somebody about poaching a green zone or poaching a no-take zone when you end up getting you killed? And in the Western Indian Ocean, this highlights the necessity of poverty alleviation strategies for conservation obviously outside the scope of this study. But here in Australia, we found a variety of justifications, right? And in general, it gives us the idea that there is some potential to leverage stewardship beliefs and make reporting easier because a lot of people either said it's not worth the hassle, we had obstacles to report, we just gave them the benefit of the doubt, or you know what? It's the Brumbo's job to do that, not mine, right? So I wanna quickly focus in on conflict avoidance and talk about the role that institutions can play in conflict avoidance. So you can reduce risk and conflict with institutions because they provide avenues, incentives, and protection to whistleblowers, right? And these successful efforts have included the Crime Stoppers Program, which operates in over 21 countries, and anti-poaching hotlines, which exist in every state of the United States. And these generally increase your group cohesion, improve your relations between authorities and resource users, and lastly, and probably most importantly, is they act as deterrents for future crimes, not just current crimes, right? And these initiatives can obviously be abused. People can false report, they can give misleading reports so they can go and poach where they said it's not happening. They can go in and they can, you know, take revenge on their neighbor. But these false reports can actually be reduced by offering financial incentives that are contingent upon successful prosecution. And so a great example of this especially is in the United States, the Lacey Act, which provides this financial incentives to individuals who give information that leads to a successful prosecution. And once they gave financial incentives, it drastically increased your credible reporting to the point where individuals or whistleblowers are now the number one source of fraud detection in the United States. So. To go one step further with institutions that we can measure in this case, we looked at how reporting and confronting, we found that reporting and confronting were positively related to rule agreement and participation. But as you can see here, this is not a significant effect, or this was very significant, or more significant, sorry. So rule agreement in general was more important than participation for positive engagement. And this is really contrary to a lot of research that shows if you allow people to participate, they're gonna be on your side regardless of whether or not they agree with the rule because they've been able to participate. But our research suggests this is not the case for reporting poachers itself. And then finally, you'll see that joining poachers was negatively related to rule agreement, which is fairly straightforward. If you don't agree with the rule, you'll probably go and join others that are doing it, right? So in summary, inaction was our most common response to poaching. The primary reasons for inaction were conflict avoidance, the idea that it's not their jurisdiction or their responsibility, and the perception that poaching is happening as survival. And engagement related to outcomes is more important than participation, and this really highlights the need for equitable management practices that consider everyone. And finally, institutions that encourage and incentivize the reporting of poachers, I think, are currently being underutilized and represent a really 
good way forward. So in conclusion, measuring and understanding <laughs> blockchain is bloody difficult. Josh has probably seen me go consecutively grayer every year that I've been here, and I swear it's all because of this thesis, right? Grayer than me, man. Yep, thanks buddy. It's because you're a rabbi. Um, <laughs> Secondly, social surveys did indicate relatively low levels of poaching, but our derelict fishing gear surveys showed how this translates in the water, right? And in these inshore island groups, which is where most of our results come from, you have relatively good enforcement, or not relatively good enforcement, but it's a lot easier to patrol these areas, right? So what happens when you go 100 kilometers off, 150 off? Like, we have no idea what's going on out there. And I know that they're using a lot of fixed wing and helicopter and the rest, but it just goes to, to make you ask the question, you know, what are the actual levels and how are you ever gonna find out? I'm not sure. But there's numerous misperceptions that may be contributing to ongoing poaching, right? Like the false consensus effect, the idea of no real risk of detection, uh, pluralistic ignorance. And these can and are currently being addressed through targeted communication strategies from the Marine Park. And then I would say that we have this need to further develop these proxy indicators of poaching, right? Because we've shown how they give us a higher level and how they can potentially give us a better estimate of it, but at the current state of knowledge, we just can't quite do it. And last, I'll leave you with the idea that institutions can be used to encourage responsible and ethical reporting by resource users, but we're not using, utilizing them enough. So, I've had one research outcome that I really want to highlight here, and that's the fact that I've been lucky enough to have a very collaborative cooperation with the Field Management Compliance Unit at Group Rampa. And so I've been able to provide research that they can use to adapt their communication strategy. And so kind of they've shifted their, their focus away from not wanting to look like the bad guys to increasing the fact that people are getting caught, right? It's happening. And just, you know, out of curiosity, what do you guys think of climate? I can tell you it's $2,100, so it's not an insignificant fine. It's quite a price. Commercial fishermen are tens of thousands, right? They're also telling us that they're getting out and they're targeting illegal fishing hotspots during these at-risk periods. And that illegal fishing in general is something that they're serious about. So if you're a poacher and you're seeing this stuff coming out in the news, you're going to say, well, maybe it's not worth the risk, right? They're also emphasizing the fact that we need to help protect the reef and report. So this is one of these institutions that typically isn't used, but is currently available here on the reef itself. And the last thing that they're doing is also publicizing all the different technologies that they can use to get these poachers. So this is gonna make you think, again, maybe it's not worth the risk. So with that, I've had a few research outputs during my thesis, and I'd like to end with a misspelled gratitude that Gary told me about <laughs> 35 minutes ago. Um, but I'd just like to thank everyone who's given me a semblance of work-life balance, and especially everyone who helped me collect 21 months of poaching surveys, right? Mm -hmm. Special thanks especially to Professors Gary Russ and Josh Sinner. You guys have gone above and beyond in so many ways and capacities for me. I've been really lucky to work as part of your team. And Terry, I'd love to thank you for the scholarship. <laughs> Hopefully you think it's worth it. Um, I'd also like to thank Grubrumpa, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, and the women that keep this place running. So Jenny, Alana, Olga, Janet, and Viv, thank you very much. With that, I welcome any questions.